struggle in the states between the races has always been bloody, but it has been one-sided. The Negro has been doing most of the bleeding. But I believe he's beginning to feel that bleeding should be reciprocal. Uh, it should be done equally on both sides. Everybody should bleed. If, if, if the Negro is going to bleed, everybody should bleed. And I think he's beginning to see this. It should be equalized. The struggle of the colored peoples of the world against the forces of Western imperialism and its agents has been going on for a long time. On the continents of North and South America, in Asia, in Africa, oppressed peoples have been waging a tireless campaign against domination at the hands of imperialists and their insane doctrine of racial supremacy. But at the very moment when the last outpost of colonialist barbarians seemed most comfortable, at the very moment when representatives of the self-styled master race feel most secure and certain of continuing their vicious schemes of enslavement, our people are affirming their humanity. Colored people virtually live as a colonized nation under racist and economic oppression. Well, for the past 10 years, the struggle in America has been confined to what has been projected to the public as a civil rights struggle. And uh, in that context, it has remained a domestic problem. It has remained within the jurisdiction of the United States. And it has, and as such, it has been impossible for the Afro-American, for American Negroes, to try and enlist the support of other dark-skinned uh, people who are being oppressed the world over in, in that struggle. And the difference now uh, in the direction that the uh, struggle is taking from that, from the direction that the struggle has been going in in the past, there are many uh, of our people who are thinking more deeply and more broadly and are beginning to see the importance of lifting it uh, out of the national context or out of the domestic context or beyond the jurisdiction of the United States government. And the only way this can be done is by internationalizing the problem and, and putting it uh, at a level where it can be taken into the United Nations and then all of the other independent nations on this earth can involve themselves in our struggle and support us. And uh, the only way by this, of which this can be done, instead of it being called civil rights in the future, we're going to have to label it a human rights struggle or the struggle for human rights. And as such, we can then take it into the United Nations uh, through the avenues that have been set up by the United Nations uh, Commission on Human Rights. Uh, we can take the, our problem before the United Nations in the same uh, manner that the problem of South Africa, Angola, Mozambique, Hungary, the Arab refugee problem, it, it becomes a world problem. And as a world problem, then the uh, uh, Afro-American or the so-called Negroes have more of a chance of getting some real meaningful results because uh, it's not left up to the one who's responsible for it anymore. But it's, 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 it's uh, put at a level where the whole world can see that our fight is wrong. And they can bring the moral support of the entire world on our side against this force that has stood in our path in the, in the uh, past. It also makes a difference in the leadership. Those who have been posing as leaders of our people uh, in America in the past, won't, they can pose on this local stage where Uncle Sam is the master of the show and can prop them up and make them look good or make them look better than they actually are by giving them token gains and building them up uh, an image. But when, you, when they step onto the international stage or the world stage, then Uncle Sam can't prop them up anymore. And their ability or lack of ability becomes exposed. And if they can lead us forward, they remain leaders. But if they can't, then they have to step aside and more qualified and bona fide leaders step up from the masses of our people and then we get more, uh, we get faster progress, we get more results. Malcolm X came from the masses as a genuine leader of his people. He was well aware of the false divisions planted between them, for he himself had overcome many of these artificial barriers to emerge as a voice which raised our strongest demands for freedom and justice in America. This man combined his recognition of the chief enemy of the African and Afro-American people with an objective knowledge of where our strength lay. He talks about the black intellectual, 
He talks about education, revolutionary education. He talks about the task of our women. Well, in the past, the, the uh, Afro-American or American Negro intellectual uh, perhaps uh, per permitted himself to be used in a way that wasn't really beneficial to the overall uh, Afro-American struggle. But I think today that these, I think today these uh, intellectuals have begun to uh, undertake a new appraisal of the problem, uh, looking at it as it actually is, and are beginning to see it more in the international context and the relation that it has with the African uh, struggle. And the African intellectual is beginning to look at the problem uh, in the African context and see that what might be good in one country uh, in order for it to be used in another country has to be rearranged. You take African socialism. Many of the a African intellectuals that have analyzed the uh, approach of socialism are beginning to see where the African has to use a form of socialism that, uh, uh, that fits into the African context, whereas uh, the form that is used in a European country might be good for that particular European country. It doesn't fit as well into the African context. So I think the African intellectual is making that contribution, and he's making it well. One thing that I uh, became aware of in my traveling recently through Africa and the Middle East, in every country that you go to, uh, usually the degree of progress can never be separated uh, from the woman. If you're in a country that's progressive, the woman is progressive. If you're in a country that reflects the consciousness uh, toward the importance of education, it's because the woman is aware of the importance of education. But in every backward country, you'll find the women are backward. And in every country where education is not stressed, it's because the women don't have education. So one of the things I became thoroughly convinced of in my recent travels is the importance of giving freedom to the woman, giving her education, and giving her the incentive to get out there and put that same uh, spirit and understanding in the children. And I, I frankly am proud of the contribution that our women have made in the struggle for freedom. And I'm one person who's for giving them all of the leeway possible because they've made a greater contribution than many of us men. And uh, one of the best ways that they can help is to encourage the man uh, uh, try and inspire him to be more militant and turn him away from being nonviolent and passive and meek and, and Uncle Tomish. Make him uh, aware uh, that the black woman wants to see her man be a man instead of around here uh, using religion as an excuse to be a coward and uh, uh, some of the things that he's been reflecting here lately. Most people, when we say Afro-American, uh, they think only of the Negroes in the United States. But they don't realize that two-thirds of Brazil uh, uh, consist of people of African blood, which means they're also Afro-American because Brazil is in South America. And in all of these, uh, many of these countries in South America and Central America, and even in Canada, uh, they are heavily populated with people whose ancestors came from Africa. So when you total up the number of Afro-Americans, real Afro-Americans, uh, in the Western Hemisphere there are perhaps a hundred million. And if these people ever unite among themselves, not only is it necessary for the Afro-Americans in the United States to be organized, but, uh, but it's also necessary for the Afro-Americans in the Caribbean, or the, the Afro-Cubans, uh, the Afro-Brazilians. It's, it's necessary for all of them to be organized. And then once they are organized in each place, we have to organize among ourselves so that the Afro-American in the United States will be uh, working uh, in conjunction in a coordinated program with those who are in Cuba and those in Brazil and those in Venezuela and those throughout the Caribbean and Haiti and in the West Indian Islands. And in this way, we actually get strength. And it's not an accident that there's no organization existing in the Western Hemisphere that's designed toward that end. It would be the one of the, it would be a direct threat to imperialism as it really exists, and, and to colonialism as it exists in the West. And one of the things that's going to help to bring this about is, is uh, again, is the independence of Africa. And one of the only reasons in the, uh, that we in the West have never organized, we have hated our image and our African image. And because Africa has been in the hands of people who have created an image of Africa that's negative and hateful, and uh, it has been hateful to us, we haven't wanted to identify with it. But now that Africa is getting independent and in a position to create its own image and it's a positive image, 
Uh, those of us in the West look at the African image and see how positive it is. We begin to identify with it. We become proud of, of Africa, and we, we become proud of our African blood, our a African heritage. And this is what is beginning to make the Africans in the Western Hemisphere today have developed more race pride. And it's, as this race pride has developed, then it has a tendency to make us want to unite together and work together. And your Western imperialists and colonialists uh, consider this to be a grave threat, more threat than uh, communism or Marxism or socialism or anything else. The Africanism is what they consider to be the real threat. Yes, undoubtedly. One of the major elements at the center of Malcolm X's revolutionary strategy is solidarity, the natural solidarity which must be restored between the Afro-American and his African brother in their common fight against a common enemy. The organization of Afro-American unity sees the only hope uh, for the black man in America uh, in a strong Africa and, and the necessity of the Afro-American becoming uh, inseparably linked with the uh, overall program that is, that's existing on the African continent. The two problems must, go, must be solved together, and the two forces must go forward together. And so the Organization of Afro-American Unity has a program to link the Afro-Americans with the Africans and the Africans with the Afro-Americans. When I say Afro-Americans, I mean those throughout the entire Western Hemisphere. This is our only hope. Our hope is in a strong Africa. And when Africa is strong, our position in America will be one of respect. But if Africa is weak, we will never be in a position of respect in America. I, th they used to have a saying that one doesn't have a Chinaman's chance. But they don't say that anymore. They used that expression back when China was weak. But now since uh, Mao Zedong has been successful in making China a strong country, uh, uh, the Chinese have more chance than anybody else. So this saying has become outdated. Well, just as it took a strong China to give a Chinese person respect wherever that Chinese person is found on this earth. Uh, when we get a strong Africa, uh, the person of African origin or African ancestry will be respected any place on this earth, even in America. But he will not be respected in America until Africa is strong, just as the Chinaman wasn't respected abroad until China became strong. He was a leader who knew that self-reliance was the only security for lasting freedom and independence. 